My name is Tom Sanderson, co-director of Transnational Threats at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you so much for joining this, us this morning. Uh, we have two superb speakers. Graham is our guest today, Graham Wood, and Dr. Tony Korsman will offer some comments on Graham's uh, article in The Atlantic, his excellent article, and then I'll offer a few questions and then turn it out to the, uh, the rest of you for uh, engagement. Since we have such a small group here, uh, I thought we'll go around the room and have everyone introduce themselves, your name and, and where you're from, and then we'll open it up to Graham for uh, uh, about 10, 15 minutes of comments, and then to Tony. Okay, Olivia? I'm uh, John Hurley. I'm across the street at St. Matthew's Cathedral, but I uh, teach part-time at Catholic University, uh, most recently politics, international politics and religion, and I used to be in the Foreign Service, my previous hierarchy. <laughs> yeah, I'm John Colclasure, Air Force Colonel, retired. I teach now over at Fort Belvoir for Command and General Staff Officers course. They wanted a blue suitor in there too, so I do that. I teach multinational operations, creative thinking, things of that ilk. Uh, good morning. I'm Josh Rosakis. I uh, work as Tom's RA at the TNT project. I'm Hunter Keith. Uh, I work at uh, DAI on uh, violent extremism and governance. Hi, I'm Mohamed Gadar. I used to intern for Tom and just here at a personal interest. Uh, I'm Alvaro Gini. I work at CSIS with the Brown Chair. Hi, I'm Max Peck. I'm in the Middle East program here at CSIS. Hi, I'm Mike. I work at the Italian Embassy. Nathan Puffer, adjunct on TNT and Senior Vice President of Global Strategies in North America. Caleb Johnson, I'm here at CSIS in the Strategic Planning Department. My name is Katerie Carmola, and uh, now I'm a consultant for the private security industry, but before then I was a professor of political science and taught on comparative terrorism. I'm Tony Cordesman. I hold the Burke Chair in Strategy here at CSIS. And uh, I'm Graham Wood. I'm a contributing editor at the New Republic magazine and the Atlantic magazine, and uh, I wrote this year a uh, large article about what ISIS really wants. Great. I'll actually pass this around for those folks who haven't seen it. Um, but as that's passed around, we'll uh, let Graham begin with his comments. Graham, thank you so much for coming down, making the trip during the storm. This has received tremendous attention, well deserved. Uh, Hunter introduced you to me, and, and I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. So go for it. Thanks. Um, well, as the cover suggests, I, I was um, trying to ask this fairly simple question. And, and my editor suggested that I ask it uh, with a, a, almost a faux naivete. What does ISIS want? And um, as I tried to ask it, I discovered there was nothing faux about the naivete whatsoever. Uh, it was very, um, very murky uh, what, what ISIS wanted. And I, I think in, in many ways, the ways that the question had been implicitly and explicitly answered in uh, public discourse had actually uh, confused and, and muddied the answer to that, uh, that, that actually turned out to be the case. Um, I'll tell you first just how I went about this. Um, there are, as I, I think everybody in this room knows, uh, there's quite a few statements that are put out by the Islamic State itself. And uh, these, of course, are regarded as, uh, and they're, they're verifiable statements, uh, and they're reliably translated into uh, into English and other other Western languages as well. So um, I, I regard, regarded those uh, as, shall we say, primary sources, and was looking from there to voices outside of the Islamic State, since the Islamic State 
doesn't really answer press requests or, e or email in, in a conventional way. Um, voices outside the Islamic State that were, were viewed by, um, by the reliable voices within it as, um, or that were viewed as reflecting some of the doctrinal consensus of the Islamic State uh, in the things they were saying. Um, and this was partially just to compare what they said to the official pronouncements, but also to see who was looking to these voices as sources of authority or consistency. Um, there had been studies done on social media, for example, to find out which, which accounts seemed to be uh, looked to with deference. Uh, which ones seem to be followed by the, the verified other accounts that, that uh, were, uh, were known to be supporters of the Islamic State. And of course, this is a, this is a highly, uh, um, there are many problems with, with, with this approach, but it's the one that clearly was as, as good as I could get in finding out what the Islamic State wanted in theory. Uh, and I, I, I stress that that is the project that I was undertaking, it was to find out ideologically, doctrinally, what the Islamic State wanted and how it viewed itself with the intention of, of, of figuring that out and perhaps understanding something about the attraction that it was exerting to what we now know are, are uh, tens of thousands of, of foreign fighters and, and thousands of foreign fighters from Western countries. So, where that took me initially, uh, in addition to the, the digital explorations, was uh, to um, two groups of people. One individual in Australia named Musa Cerantonio, uh, who was named in a King's College London um, study as one of the two most important nodes of doctrinal enforcement and, and dissemination. Uh, and. Uh, then this uh, well-known group within the United Kingdom, uh, formerly known as Al Muhajirun, uh, a group uh, of uh, very media-savvy um, uh, fans of the Islamic State who have are well known to the public, also well known to authorities, and who, at the time I was speaking to them, had been prevented from leaving to go to the Islamic State through confiscation of their passports. Although some members of that group already had gone. And uh, actually, on the on the very days that I was speaking to their to their comrades in, in the UK, were tweeting out photographs of themselves in Raqqa with with uh, with weapons and and uh, in one case a newborn son. So I went to London. I spoke to these people, and what I found was that they had, uh, especially the media savvy ones, they they had spoken to many reporters before. The small contribution that I was hoping to add, though, was to ask them not just the, the sort of um, cable news style questions that they had had before, uh, such as, what's wrong with you? Uh, um, <laughs> it, it was, but really, in detail, what do you believe? What is it that, that what do you think? What is this, this, this project that you're calling a caliphate? And what distinguishes it, is, distinguishes it from, from previous uh, types of of jihadism that, that I might have heard or read about in the past. And um, the distinctions became quite clear. Um, they, their, their leader, a uh, very well-known guy named Anjum Chowdhury, he, he was describing the caliphate as, as a kind of ideological light switch that had been thrown uh, that was going to attract him and others, uh, the, the way an insect would be attracted to light. He, it, he said, uh, as a Muslim, he considered, uh, he gave the figure 80%. 80% of, of Islam he considered to have been essentially in abeyance, um, in the absence of, of a proper Islamic state. And he, he said that once a valid caliphate had been declared, uh, a whole uh, slew of obligations um, suddenly were, were awakened. Uh, and that, he, he expressed to me, was why, um, why the middle of last, of, of last year, the time of the declaration of the caliphate, was so crucial as a turning point in the attraction of, uh, of, um, 
of Syria to like-minded individuals. So there are, are plenty of, of particular aspects of, of his, uh, his version of the caliphate that I can get into. Um, but I would just like to express that he seemed to think of this as a utopian project. Um, it was not merely, although it was this too, a political one or a, a uh, expression of defiance, but it was a society that he was describing that would be fully realized uh, and include uh, all sorts of very, utopian is not even an, an adequate word for it, extremely optimistic views of how things would eventually be organized. Uh, the ability of a state to provide, for example, free health care, free food, free housing, free clothing to all of its citizens. That, that was the kind of utopian view that he was, was in particular pushing out and that uh, I, I think uh, in his core group was, was certainly an, an article of, of, uh, of great importance and attraction to the caliphate. What I learned from the Australian was slightly different. Um, he was almost entirely consistent ideologically with the London group. Um, but he stressed a different, a different aspect, which um, we, we could also see throughout the primary documents. Um, and that is an apocalypticism. This was his, um, I would say, main preoccupation. And uh, he recently came out with, you can look it up online, a rather interesting learned document trying to interpret, interpret the hadith mention of a group called Arum, the the Rome, uh, of Rome or the Romans. And his, his claim, rather heterodox, is that the mention of the Romans as uh, the army that will meet, the, the, um, the, will meet Islam at the city in Dabiq in northern Syria, according to his interpretation, uh, actually uh, referred to the army of the Republic of Turkey, which um, I can get into why he thinks that. He believes that the, the that the mention of Rome in Hadith would, would have referred to the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, which was in Constantinople, and the closest continuer of that group would be Istanbul slash Ankara today. Um, it was striking to me to, to hear him speak in these apocalyptic terms, because not because it was the first time anyone from um, this this long and or longish now uh, and diverse tradition of al-Qaeda had spoken in apocalyptic terms, but he, he was very clear that uh, these were events that he expected to happen soon. Um, and this, as I think a matter of consistency, is, is something that, that uh, I would see constantly in social media, uh, in the official pronouncements of the state, the propaganda that would come out the the imminent fulfillment of prophecies is something that in his in his view i i was actually i was inclined to think that this was uh something that even if he spoke of it in literal imminent terms was in some way uh flexible or metaphorical he urged me not to see it that way uh, and has urged me actually since the article came out not to see things that way but to say look we really do believe he said, even you who have, you have written about this uh, with, with clarity in your article, he says, I sense that even you don't think that it's actually going to unfold quite like this and quite in the timetable that, that, that we claim. Uh, that is, not only do you not think it's going to happen, but you don't think that we think it's going to happen. He says, we do. That is our view. And that ultimately was one of the two big distinctions that I came to find in discussing these issues with, with, these, with these people was, was the, the emphasis on um, imminent apocalyptic thinking uh, was distinguishing them from, say, the old, um, the old guard of the core group of Al-Qaeda. And then secondarily, or secondly, but actually no less of a priority, their emphasis on um, attacking other Muslims. This, this seemed to be an, an extraordinarily um, important thing to, to them in a way that, in, in my understanding of that old guard of, Al of the core group of Al-Qaeda, it never was. Uh, the, uh, the way that they, that 
both groups, both in Aust Australia and in the UK, uh, expressed um, zeal for excommunication was quite jarring. Um, they would, without any hesitation, declare all current Muslim heads of state non-Muslims, uh, apostates. And they were very willing to, to declare um, ma essentially mass excommunication on the basis of, of, um, of sin, essentially. Um, but sin of a particular type that they thought amounted to as a result of, of, of being uh, sin that, that, had, that, that, had, that was taking place in conditions of, of non-ignorance. That, that is, the people who were making, doing the sins knew that it was sinful and were, in effect, denying the inerrancy of the, of the laws that, 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 uh, that made it sinful. So um, they, were, they were very willing to declare excommunication on a mass basis. Um, in a way that, uh, that Al-Qaeda, in my understanding, had, had not been willing to do. So these are the, 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 two, main, um, the two main distinctions between Al-Qaeda and the people I spoke to. Um, I might reserve some time later to talk about w what uh, their vision of a caliphate means for the way we might approach, uh, approach them, and particularly how, how we might approach uh, the questions uh, of uh, of propaganda, radicalization, of the possible overseas recruits who I, I think are, are likely to be more ideologically based than um, some of the pe people in the region who might have been more, um, more accidentally caught up in all of this. So um, I, I think I'll leave it with that and, and turn it over to Dr. Cordesman. Graham, I have to say that in many areas I think you bring an expertise to this that's a little hard to provide a lot of background on. But there is one thing that struck me about your work which I think is very important to all of us who are dealing with the upheavals and problems in the Middle East. And that is, first, very often I have seen people focus on the number of volunteers and where the volunteers come from. And that's not unimportant. But if you look at similar movements in totally different contexts, the Russian Revolution, for example, and how you saw the Bolsheviks emerge as a leading force and take control, or if you look at the cycles of control and power struggles in the French Revolution, or you look at other factional groups which have been bound by very strong ideologies. What is really striking is how important the cadres are and how important the belief structures of the cadres are and consistency in the cadres have been. You also see that they have been able to enforce an ideological consistency in the middle of climates of violence and revolution. Almost all of them came to power by excluding similar movements which were more moderate. At no point, if you look at this, either in terms of their success or failure in the classic sense, did public opinion broadly really matter. It was how these cadres influenced the course of violence and those actively involved in violence, and particularly in enforcing the authority of the state. Now, I'm not going to try to push these analogies too far. There is obviously no real similarity between this vision of Islam the vision of Marxism or the vision of what became a almost inchoate concept of secular class struggle in the French Revolution. But I do think it is important for us to pay a lot of attention to this because if you have these cadres, one thing that historically has not particularly mattered 
is do you counter them by educating people that there are problems in their belief structure? And the answer, by and large, has never been that you can easily counter the forces that lead people to become involved and support these patterns of violence that are the reasons they're recruited. They become caught up in a structure of power, a structure of ideas whose simplicity and contrast, whose absolutism is by itself a major tool in moving toward violence. And yes, of course, in the case of the French Revolution, the structure eventually imploded and in the case of the Russian Revolution, it transformed into classic authoritarianism and state control. But I think as we look at this too, um, one of the things that I notice about what seems to be the attraction, and perhaps you can touch on this in your comments, is it isn't so much that people will believe what these cadres believe in detail, it is they have so little reason to trust the traditional authority structures around them. Now you began to see this in the Arab Development Reports that were issued in 2003. It was really striking to see that if you looked at the demographics that are driving the region, and I won't get into alienation in Europe, the population, according to what we estimate today in the MENA region, is a little over six times what it was in 1950. The number of young men and young people, 24 and under, as a percentage of the population is twice what it is in the United States and about three times what it is in most of Europe. Looking at some of the studies done, the outliers for young men, the number of people unemployed directly or indirectly, were far higher than in any other region. Perceptions of corruption, the illegitimacy of traditional societies and the state were radically different even if people did not have a clear idea of what they wanted and where they were going to go. So I think that one real question here, and uh, if they remain unified, if they become a subject with this many reasons why people both alienated outside young men and women, but above all, the large majority of people who come from the region have no reason to either trust their future or trust the secular society or even the traditional patterns of education and religious authority figures, how do you counter? How do you deal with this threat? Do you simply wait till it burns its way out or it transforms itself? I think these are issues we really need to address because let me just conclude with this comment. I look back to the previous war in Iraq when David Petraeus asked the question of how does this war end? And one of the problems I have with the way we've been approaching the Islamic State is if the cadres do have this impact, and there are these broad factors, if we do defeat the Islamic State militarily, or through classic counterinsurgency, what kind of stability or order or lasting impact do you have? I don't know if you touched at all on the Al Nusra front, but given the fact that decisively defeated the one major moderate group of rebels in Syria we backed for the second time last week, and I'll leave it to the experts as to whether there's any chance they're going to recover. But at the end of it, if you occupy Mosul, if you win in Tikrit, and if these ideological concepts have the strength and unity you found, 
What does it actually matter? What is the strategy, if any, that we seem to be pursuing, both in Iraq and Syria, and then looking on to, and I don't know if you'd care to comment, on the similarities to Libya and Yemen and other areas. But these are issues where I think, quite frankly, as I look at the media comments and some of the military actions we're taking, and some of the focus on numbers of foreign volunteers rather than cadres, really bother me not so much about the Islamic State's ideology, but ours. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Graham, I'll give you a chance to respond to that. And then uh, if we do want to go into the Libya side, maybe Hunter Keith could offer a couple comments on Libya. But let's uh, have Graham respond, and then I'll uh, ask a couple questions to get the dialogue going. So uh, Dr. Kortisman, not, not only do I uh, agree with many of the areas of emphasis that you've raised, but um, I've found that many supporters of the Islamic State agree as well. That is, some of these questions about the origins and the, the important background aspects of where this group came from, why it arose when it did, and why it became a source of authority. Um, I think that I, I have had, I've had, um, I've had communication w with uh, supporters of the Islamic State who have directly pointed to many of the topics that, that you raise, the, the issues of development in the region, the lack of, of authority that, uh, from, uh, from the governments and lacks thereof in, in the areas where the Islamic State has arisen. And they've expressed that this is part of the mechanism of the rise of, of the group that they support. They say that the fact that there is chaos, the fact that there are uh, there there are clearly corrupt governments that have predatory relationships with their populations, this is entirely in fa in in the Islamic State's favor, and it's part of the mechanism of its rise. That first, that there will be chaos, first there will be a lack of authority, and that the Islamic State, with an assist from God Himself, will arise and and. Have, will exert the kind of anti-entropic force that uh, that's that's that uh, is going to be sought by by the people in the region, um, and that that I think is uh, key to understanding how the Islamic State believes it will continue to to uh, survive and to expand, and so uh, to speak of Libya, for example, the the chaos of Libya, the failure of Libya to 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 uh, turn into anything that resembled order, uh, that is, I think, a model for how the Islamic State will will expect to expand. It will not be through conquest on the fringes of the territory that it has, but it will be um, pockets of anarchy into which it can step. And I think it it would likely view the sources of those anarchy is, is being a, a, a menu of, of, of um, a menu of sources that, that it would regard as very favorable, um, just as a, as a matter of the number of, of uh, ways in which uh, the, the Muslim world in general is troubled in terms of, of misgovernment, lack of human development, all of these are considered to be in the Islamic State's favor. So um, I, on the question of whether the ideology of the state is going to remain as consistent as it's been, I would be surprised if, if, it, if it did, only because it could hardly be more consistent as it is in this early, almost pre-routinized kind of, of, of uh, stage in its development. That said, the ability that it has to keep that, that message um, enforced and consistent at this point, I can, I think is remarkable, um, and you know even as I spoke to um, the supporter in in Australia, he uh, he told me some stories about the beginning of the state, which I found um, quite amazing. He said that at some point uh, he agreed, as I mentioned before, with the the idea that the London Group had about 
Islam essentially not being practical, practicable uh, without an Islamic state. And so he, he said that at, some, at, at an early point in the middle of last year, uh, there was a group within the Islamic state that noticed that the conditions for a caliphate had been met. And he said that they had approached the leadership of what was then ISIS and said, the conditions have been met. You are now obliged to declare a caliphate. And if you do not do that, then we will factionalize and we will fight against you. We, we, we are obliged to do that. So the, the, um, the actual difference between someone who has stood up and said, I am caliph, and someone who has not is zero. There, there is nothing that happened uh, when that declaration took place practically. Um, but apparently it was enough to, to have a significant portion of, of, of ideologues within the Islamic State saying that it was, uh, that it was a deal breaker uh, and that it would, would cause uh, internecine fighting between that group. So I, I have been surprised by uh, the amount of, of consistency and I, I don't know exactly the mechanism that, uh, that it would take to, um, for it to break down. Um, with time, like I say, I could hardly imagine it becoming more consistent. On the other hand, how it would, would cease to be so is not something I can, can predict. Fantastic, thank you, both Graham and, uh, and Dr. Cordesman. Let me start off with a question, a, a couple of things. One is uh, that last example you gave, Graham, of um, uh, factionalization and pushing the leadership to declare the caliphate and then to govern as, as such. How much influence is there coming up from the bottom as time goes on from fighters, from uh, not just foreign fighters coming in who may be just young guns, but more learned individuals? And number two, how does ISIS educate those young guys coming in who may not be educated? Do they want them to be educated? Is there a formal process for that happening? Yeah, so I, I'm afraid a lot of these questions I'm just going to have to plead ignorance on, but I, I, can, I can certainly cite research of others uh, describing uh, the indoctrin indoctrination processes of, of new recruits. They exist, they're formalized. And then the question of whether, the, um, whether there is a kind of bottom-up influence on, on ideology. It's, it's been interesting to watch examples such as uh, the... Uh, the revelation that there is slavery going on, um, the burning of the Jordanian pilot. Uh, there has been this, this moment of cognitive dis dissonance that, that you can watch in real time in which um, there have been, there were supporters of the Islamic State who said, no, 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 slavery is not happening. And then, of course, the Islamic State itself comes out with propaganda that says slavery is happening and this is the reason why if you, if you um, disagree with the practice, you are an apostate. Um, so, th it's uh, that cognitive dissonance ended rapidly with acquiescence to the official position of the Islamic State. Likewise, with the burning of the Jordanian, Jordanian pilot, uh, there was, I think, a, a more muted um, sense of, of uh, doubt about whether this was a Islamically proper reaction. Um, but the Islamic State came out with its its line. Uh, you know, it's a, a very interesting reading, shall we say, uh, of, uh, of of Islamic laws of war. But it came out with its ideological justification, its its uh, citation of history and scripture, and that that seemed to quiet the dissent. So um, the top down aspects of this seem seem to be prevailing. Let's open it up. Uh, again, just uh, identify yourself before asking the question. Thanks, uh, Graham, uh, and thanks for bringing him in. This is uh, exciting, as I said before, to uh, have such a, uh, uh, a really terribly interesting, pr provocative article. Uh, you know, we've all been struggling with, with just the questions that you asked. I looked at Baghdadi's sort of emergence and the emergency of IS as, you know, he's a brilliant, you know, uh, military tactician. He's done a great job sort of fighting and expanding the, the, his, uh, uh, the, the area that he manages. He's, he's uh, 
got the vision thing. He can get people, he can express it, he can get people uh, behind him. Uh, he's uh, done great financial management. Uh, he's uh, uh, is trying to organize uh, the state so it has uh, uh, governance. And he's done an incredibly creative uh, use of terrorism uh, to support his uh, his uh, military tactics. Uh, but you know, as a as a Middle East hand, I I, I had trouble with the with the ideological roots, and that, that's the thing that, that your article really really. Uh, made me really interested to try to uh, see some of the reasons that they, they may be doing things which to me appear to be, to quote Obama, un-Islamic, uh, uh, and uh, uh, m you know, maybe the roots of the, the reasons they're doing, you know, there's some of these terrible things uh, in trying to get the, uh, you know, the uh, end of time come quickly. Uh, but. I find it very hard to believe that 95% of the people who are following uh, the leadership really understands or believes in the in the sort of ideological roots. You know, you've talked to some people who are real scholars and who have had their own sort of Talmudic uh, interpretations of how things are being done. I, I just personally think that 90% of the people are there just because it seems like a fun thing to do and they don't like what they're doing. Uh, no jobs, as you said. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, about that? Uh, yes, I, I, I certainly agree that, that the ideological penetration is not 100 percent. I don't think it's even 95 percent. Um, that said, this is not uh, this is not just the province of the the very small group of, of scholarly individuals who might be attracted to the Islamic State. the um, the general the general line, the slogans, these are things that are ubiquitous uh, on, for example, social media. Now, how many people in the Islamic State are on Twitter? Uh, a very small number, of course. So perhaps this population aligns with the ideological minority or plurality or, or majority. I don't know. But um, what, I would, what I would certainly say is that it, it's, not, um, it's not something that one could avoid while being an active um, part of, of ISIS. And we can see that through even just through uh, the reports that we see, uh, of the images that we see on the street, um, the, 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 the public gatherings, the rhetoric, it is, it is constantly infused with this stuff. And could one live a, a, a full and, and unhappy life in the Islamic State without thinking about this very much? I think it's, it's quite possible. But you will go down the street, you will see billboards about this. You will, every bit of propaganda that comes out, um, the ticket you have on, on the dash of your car when you park in the wrong place will, will say something about the prophetic me methodology. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not knowable to me whether this is, is something that everyone believes, but it, it's certainly something that, that no one can avoid. And I think particularly in the populations that, that, are, that are coming from overseas and that are, are being um, the kind of propaganda that is being fed to them, it, it doesn't focus on this for no reason. It, it's apparently very attractive to, to, to those groups. Tony, please. Just sometimes because we focus on the Middle East, I think it is important to remember that some of these patterns are not unfamiliar. If you look back to the ideological structure of what went on during the Spanish Revolution, or if you look at the differences between the so-called white armies in Russia and the evolving Bolshevik forces, people became very clearly ideologically aligned. They didn't question. As long as there was a clear pattern of ideological leadership, it was consistent, and there was a figure that could keep people motivated, it became progressively more extreme. Now, in the French case, it imploded, finally. In the Russian and the Spanish case, depending on which side you want, uh, <clears throat> it was an open question as to which side became more extreme over time. 
And I think we need to remember these patterns because we tend to look on this as somehow being terribly cultural and terribly a matter of an individual religion or ideology, but it isn't, not historically. Uh, you could look at why the Shining Path rose and failed in Peru, and you would find many of the same given elements. The other thing I would remember here is if you happen to be an Iraqi or a Syrian Sunni, remember the other side of the ideological pressure. There's very little about the Iraqi state which has emerged that would particularly reassure a Sunni. There's very little about what has happened under Assad. The one thing I would note is that we do need to remember that the Islamic State more or less lost to the al-Nusra front. So there are limits. There is a real split here along an ideological line in Syria, and so far it is the other Islamic extremists which seem to be having the most impact on the population in Syria. But it is the Islamic State which has the most stable control of the River Valley area in the east of Syria, which is not all that populated. Graham, do you want to comment on that or just, that's good, okay. L let me touch on three things that are in the news. I'll get to you, Hunter, in just a sec. Um, and just offer your opinion on the perspective that ISIS has on these issues, some of which seem to be inconsistent. We saw the destruction of the statues and antiquities at the museum in Mosul, yet there's also an effort to uh, traffic in antiquities and to benefit from them and their value. Uh, there's also issues with their perspective on women and women rushing to join ISIS. And then there's also uh, the targeting of Christians uh, that are being used potentially for uh, chits in exchange, uh, but also be tar targeted for violence. So can you give your perspective on how the Islamic State views these three issues, antiquities, women, and Christians? Uh, yes. So on the antiquities issue is very interesting. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I saw with horror the same images that I'm sure everybody else saw of, of uh, statues being destroyed at the, the museum in Mosul. Uh, but uh, I honestly thought that it would have happened sooner. Um, but they, uh, they've been very clear about their policy about these antiquities, which is that uh, the ones they consider uh, idolatrous uh, must be destroyed. The others are fair game for sale. And sure enough, they're on the market. So I, I think that they, um, they may very well be following through on exactly what they claim to be doing. And then on the issue of women, uh, this is another interesting split, I think, between the Islamic State and the old guard of Al-Qaeda. And this was, was put to me by some European researchers on this topic uh, very clearly. They, they said, in, in the old days, if you wanted to to bring women to, uh, to participate in violent jihad overseas, uh, it was quite difficult to find someone who was a conservative Muslim woman who would meet with, with a recruiter on a street in, in London, whereas now this is the one way in, in, in which uh, online recruiting has really changed things. You can very effectively recruit uh, women to, to, to join. And so this is something that I think the Islamic State is is trying very hard to do because of this goal of creating a demographically whole society. And rather than just finding some people to strap bombs to, to create a place that, that is going to have a, 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 a true depth and durability. Um, and then on, on the topic of Christians, I, um, I would only say that, that, that they, their own view of, of trading of hostages is that it's perfectly fine thing to do. They can't. They say they cannot trade apostates. Apostates, there's just no choice. They have to be killed. But uh, Christians, uh, journalists, uh, they see no uh, inconsistency or moral qualms about getting whatever they can for them. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, Hunter Keith, please. I wanted to go back to the earlier question uh, that dealt with the, the degree of ideological penetration that we might be seeing from the Islamic State on down in societies um, like the Iraqi one and the Syrian one, possibly even the Libyan one. Um, you and I have been talking about uh, the implications of the, the work that you've done for more than a month now since before the article came out. I think we could sort of anticipate what the 
uh, response uh, might be um, publicly to the the notion that this this organization is is in some ways fundamentally uh, religious and Islamic more specifically. Um, it is a controversial statement, but I do feel like the the discussion that has followed from the the article's publication has uh, in some ways missed the the um, the point of of departure, the point at which these things should be debated, and. and the way in which I think the discussion misses some of what you're trying to say is in the sense that I think that there's strategically speaking, and this is where I, I'm interested to see how this, dis this discussion here would evolve, but strategically speaking, if we're, if we're looking to make a meaningful inroad against the Islamic State on the ground, it seems to me that your argument uh, makes a very fundamental assumption, perhaps an implicit assumption, but a fundamental one, that elites matter that the ideological elites in uh, the Islamic State, particularly in Iraq and Syria, matter in a way that um, others who might feel uh, that you know, the article uh, uh, throws out and accuses a, a much larger population of, of um, being complicit with what the Islamic State does and with its ideology, um, they, might, uh, they might feel that there are other strategic implications about the non-elites, the, the broader population of Iraqis and Syrians who might have political interests, they might have narrower economic interests, they might have, and in that way, they, they might be up for grabs um, uh, in the context of a, of a Western strategy uh, moving against ISIS, um, uh, that uh, up for grabs in ways that, that your assumptions perhaps um, uh, uh, don't, don't necessarily uh, admit to. Um, and, I, and so I just wondered whether you could say something about the consequence of elites, particularly ideological elites in the Islamic State, where it pertains to our strategy against them. And I, and I guess um, to, to be a little bit more specific, if we could come up with a Sunni leader politically who was acceptable politically to the larger Sunni population in Iraq uh, and put that person in Baghdad um, in a position to attract uh, politically again all those disaffected Sunnis in places like Mosul, Ramadi, Fallujah, would that necessarily make a, a meaningful inroad against what we see uh, from the Islamic State on the ground? Or is the purity of the ideological movement at the elite level in places like Mosul and Raqqa far more consequential than that? Um, so uh, you're right to point out the, the um, importance that I'm placing in the article uh, on, in, on an elite, and specifically the ideological elite. And that's, that's purely to, to keep what was already a 10,000 word article. Uh, just at 10,000 words um, to describe this ideology uh, and not to not to place necessarily supremacy over the, the political considerations that you're describing. Um, the, the, the main point that, I, that I'd like to make about what you suggested, that is uh, whether there could be a kind of uh, ideologically impure political solution, uh, a, a satisfactory Sunni leader, I think that is perfectly possible. What I don't think is possible is for that for that uh, kind of accommodation to uh, satisfy the broader broader movement, which which may be a smaller uh, a small enough um, portion of the Islamic State and its supporters that we can safely ignore them. But the broader movement absolutely will not be satisfied by that, and there are many many reasons for that. The, the, the um, again, we might be able to discount these 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 hyper-pure, ideologically pure um, elite, elites more broadly. But I, I think that what the Islamic State has shown it can do with great success and consistency is to neutralize the uh, and nullify uh, any attempt to co-opt it on an ideological basis. So what we will continue to have, even if that accommodation works, that kind of solution works, is uh, this this base of the, the people who are attracted to the Islamic State from overseas, they will certainly not be satisfied by that. And I think it's quite likely that, that, that they would find expression for their dissatisfaction, perhaps in a place other than Iraq. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in one aspect of uh, what I've heard here today. When we teach the army, folks on this, uh, going out to confront this sort of thing, 
uh, we teach them, you've got to identify that one thing that you're facing out there in this mass, this mass, we call that the center of gravity. Whatever that thing is, it's got to be able to do something, we call that critical capabilities. To do that, you have to have something, usually a noun, like money, arms, we call that the critical requirement. All of, somewhere in there, there is a vulnerability. A vulnerability, what do you see as the one critical vulnerability that is there somewhere in ISIS? Um, well, uh, as for a military, um, a military vulnerability, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what, that, what that's going to look like. Uh, as an ideological and propaganda vulnerability, I think that for, for the reasons I just described to, to Hunter, um, the attempts that we might have to produce, for example, a counter narrative, uh, these will fail. Um, I, I think that ISIS, relative to uh, the United States, its allies, any kind of type of coalition, uh, it has that kind of insurgent cachet. It will, it, we, we cannot produce uh, anything that, that, anything that can be traced back to, to us in any way, I think, is, is tainted to such a degree that it would be a failure to, to, to try. It'd be like trying to make Microsoft popular versus the, some insurgent startup. It's just, they, they will, you, you can't possibly be cool uh, that way. So what I, what I think the vulnerability then is, is uh, the, um, the denial uh, through fact of the most extreme aspects of the propaganda. You know, if, if they're suggesting that the caliphate has these following qualities, uh, including divine favor, um, there are certain realities that we can provide to them that will make that less plausible as a claim. Um, and these would include uh, just simply a failure to expand, um, making sure that the territory shrinks, stagnates. And as I described, that if, if the expectation is that this is going to be an, a, a, a state in which Islam is uh, equitably implemented along their peculiar lines, then uh, with time, that utopian ideal, I think, will, will clearly fail. And if that happens enough, then I think that the propaganda, the, the, the ideological propaganda, will be neutralized by that, by that failure through, through time and stagnation. So I, I think that might be one, one, um, one avenue. It's just time. Yes. I'm sorry, there are folks who have walked away from it? Uh, sorry, yeah. some of the ISIS fighters, they've walked away from this sort of thing. They, that was a mistake. This is wrong. That, that has happened, correct? It, it has happened. I mean, there's, a, there's quite a bit of uh, effort to stop these people from getting out and stop their messages from getting out. And, you know, it, it's happened enough that we've heard ISIS, uh, Jürgen Totenhofer, the, the eccentric German uh, who went over there and, and interviewed ISIS fighters, they, they spoke of these people and they said, you know, I, I hope they repent. I hope they repent. So it was, it was noteworthy, first of all, that, that it wasn't the expectation that they had gone off uh, to fight back in Europe, but they had gone back and, and were dissatisfied by what they had seen. Uh, of course, we'd love to see more of those people and we'd love to have their voices not be polluted by, by our giving them a megaphone, but just by their own power to, to, to make these statements. In time, of course, there, there will only be more of them. A couple of comments. Understand that we are not forward in Iraq. We're advising from the rear. We are not providing an ideological message in a direct sense through troops or our military trainers. We are attempting to create elite forces, uh, forces capable of operating effectively in combat. There are certainly smaller elements of this, but I think this becomes critical because who's forward? Well, part of it is it's Shiite militias. Part of it is you can see an Iranian presence. Part of it is an Iraqi force where we may be able to rebalance the sectarian 
structure, but we may not be interesting to watch. And a lot of what we are doing is simply not visible. One problem with air power, particularly the kind of air power we're using, is it doesn't send a clear message to a lot of people as to exactly what is happening and where it's going on. You also need to remember that, and here I would go back to a comment made earlier, you know, if there's going to be a Sunni leader, they're going to have to emerge as an immense surprise. Because quite frankly, one of the reasons that Alawi and others lost was they were very ineffective at leading. The other problem was they were visibly and clearly for sale in the case of many of the others. And people in the Sunni areas saw this. So it's hard for them to come back and emerge as leaders that have credibility. So when you talk about ideology, one problem we have is, no, there is no one center of gravity here. You're trying to defeat an extremist movement in a country that enabled the extremist movement by having a leader which brought it to the edge of civil war before they came in. If you look at the UN casualty data after we left in 2011 and take it to the end of 2003, it was a remarkable movement toward civil conflict among the Arabs and a remarkable division between Arab and Kurd. So one of the great problems here is going to be what actually emerges and who has the ideological legitimacy or dominance. To date, and I will defer to anyone here, our effort to create anything approaching a Sunni National Guard has not had one single major cadre emerge with any stable support, in part because the central government finds it impossible to actually implement or keep its promises. Now, if we move it to the other side of this equation, when you talk about a center of gravity, yeah, it's a nice military notion. It's also how you lose a counterinsurgency because you focus on the tactical side or one idea and you're fighting a complex political military war. And why do you have that? Because the state failed and created the climate where the war now creates. Well, the other side of this is Syria. And the good news is that, yes, the extremist elements are fighting each other on occasion, but the Assad regime is even worse. And you created a situation when you have actually managed to convert half the population to internally displaced persons where is the source of ideological and political stability? Messaging from religious authority figures? When you've got 10.7 million people, according to the UN, displaced, something on the order of 5 million now under siege or without aid, 3.7 million driven out of the country. Uh, you're not messaging through tweeting and you're not having soldiers send political messages, even if we had any soldiers, which as of now we don't. So I think remember whatever we deal with here, I hate to use the term net assessment, but you have to measure both sides, not just one, and you have to consider the extraordinary operational limits that broadly exist on the U.S. role in both countries. Please. Thanks both for your comments. And I'm also reminded that two days ago, Dr. Kordesman, you led a, another conversation downstairs on survey research, Iraqi survey research throughout the Middle East, um, which was fascinating. You might want to mention some of the conclusions from those surveys. But earlier, your historical analogies I thought were really appropriate and so many times we just imagine that we have to do something now, but in previous revolutions, Russian Revolution, I want to say Chinese Revolution, French Revolution, there's very little that outside powers can do when you have an internal revolution. You can contain it. We might be in a kind of containment phase, but there's very little on the ground influence you can do when a revolution is coming from below like this. 
Well, they could always invade Vladivostok. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, successful invasion. Graham, let me ask another question concerning some of the uh, issues we've seen in the news. There are often distinctions made between Al-Qaeda and ISIS, that Al-Qaeda focuses on the far end, I mean, is more interested in expeditionary activity, with ISIS focused on establishing the caliphate. Yet you have <clears throat> what appear to be outposts for ISIS emerging. Is this organic to those areas, or is this push from the center, from ISIS? How do they view ideologically, but also practically, the presence of supporters who are pledging Bayat allegiance to them around the world? Um, my sense is that it's actually quite organic. Uh, and the, the uh, connections between, uh, perhaps with the exception of Libya, but the connections between the, the, the many different wilayat that have been, that have been declared and, and have have had their allegiance received, and the, the, the mothership, I think the, those connections are, are very easy to overstate. Um, you know, the, the Islamic State is, it is the frontline organization. Everybody keeps talking about how wealthy it is. Um, there's, there's not a great deal to lose by, by saying that, that uh, you're allied with them. Um, with Libya, obviously, we've, we've, we've seen some um, some pretty strong indications that that there is, uh, at the very least, consistency of message and branding, uh, and that uh, that I think is is roughly how uh, Libya I would think is probably the, the model that they will be looking forward toward in the future. Uh, on, on the question of the, this this far enemy issue, I, I find it very interesting that you know. The, the, ISIS has, the Islamic State's been very consistent in what it has asked its supporters to do in, uh, in terms of attacks on the United States, Western targets, and that is um, not to do them, interestingly. Um, it, it has been instead to focus on immigrating to the Islamic State, and only in, in when, when that fails to perpetrate attacks of this lone wolf variety that are not, uh, you know, officially branded sponsored attacks. So I, I, I find that a very interesting um, distinction between them and Al Qaeda that they would would sort of stay their hand a bit in, in this way, and instead, as I've said, tried to try to stalk the Islamic State itself with warm bodies and have play this long game of creating a durable entity that can can attack in a different way. Yes, please. And please remember to identify yourself. Hello. My name is Hermes Levy. I'm from the OWS. I just wanted to make some comment and have a question. Uh, the comment is, I think we have tendency to fool ourselves about the Islamic State and Islam in general, because we differentiate between what we call political Islam and uh, the other, other ideologies, it's all the same. It's all inside the book. And it's just there is an intelligence that govern and direct all of this when the, time, when the time is appropriate. Like now, it used extremism, it's cleverly used. Somebody talked about uh, the similarity that suggests the existence of a plan that is being done. So. Uh, if we want to have a clear intelligence of what is going on, we need to understand this higher level where there is intelligence that govern, that direct this movement or all the movement. The terrorism, uh, what we call the terrorism, is a verse inside the book. It's, it says, Aw yal bisukum shia. It's known. It's, when it comes to uh, the Weakness, the only weakness we can focus on is also inside the book, is when they were, the, they were divided between Shia and Sunni. It's inside the book. So uh, in, uh, in order for us to formulate something coherent and uh, uh, able to be uh, a significant response what do you think uh, is appropriate, given the information that we have also to investigate this high level that some call high politics? 
that intervene, and we usually in our analysis we don't take we don't uh, take it into account. Thank you. Um, if I've understood the point properly, I, I, so I, I I think that the the question of how we respond, especially to religious questions, which you know, as as my article makes clear, I, I do think that this is a group with with a religious background background, and the, the, my my point in saying that, which you know, this is this has been a point that that's that's drawn quite a bit of of attention that I think is a sideshow to the to the actual purpose of, of making it is um, by recognizing that that this is a religious group. I think that we we do not need to pay, take a stand on whether it is the correct interpretation of the religion that it claims to to follow. And so I I, I do think it's very important that we understand as we as we try to uh, understand propaganda attraction the the, uh, the religious nature of the group, but to uh, to avoid making points of, of, of theological fineness with authority that we cannot possibly have and shouldn't claim to have. So if, if, that, if that speaks to your point, I, I, I think we should acknowledge the nature of, of this propaganda and ideology without trying to take that, um, trying to claim authority that we do not have. So to that point, Graham, how do you interpret President Obama's position on this issue? that he's been criticized about regarding using the term Islamic or Islamist. Yeah, so the, the, the again, the, the terminological, the nomenclature uh, issues, that they are, I think it's, it's very easy to, to confuse political rhetoric with, with, that has very good purposes, building coalitions, assuring Muslims, both American and non, that there is not a, a, a fight against them with, uh, with an actual analytic failure. And uh, I'm not sure that failure is actually there, uh, uh, certainly at this point. Uh, even if, you know, if the statement is made that, that ISIS is not an Islamic group, I would say that's simply factually incorrect and in the same way it would be wrong to say that, that the Westboro Baptist Church is not a Christian group. I, it, it's just, it's just a, a matter of the traditions that, in which they fall. What, what, what I would be wary of doing, and not because it has strong negative effects, but because it has at best neutral ones, is trying to uh, trying to claim that they are incorrect in their interpretations of Islam, which the president, just like me, and just like just like uh, most people, has no authority to say. Well put. Other questions, please. Yeah, back to Hunter, and, and then we'll go to Ali. Uh, going back to the issue of communications and, and even strategic communications, the gentleman's point here, um, a very practical one, how, how do you take the fight, uh, particularly in the propaganda war to ISIS? Um, and then also to consider what uh, Dr. Kortisman has spoken about in terms of historical revolutions that have imploded in the past, imploded, um, by, you know, imploded largely because their own ideology has become something that, that can no longer sustain um, or can no longer encompass a large enough uh, group of people to sustain the uh, movement. We spend a lot of time talking about alternatives to the uh, to sort of the ISIS's inter uh, interpretation or expression of Islam and put, putting those alternatives out there, making cases for why the, the organization is not Islamic. Uh, but I wonder whether there, do you see weakness inside the organization uh, from a communications perspective or a strategic communications perspective, if we think a little bit outside the box and we think about the dangers of ideological movements that try to enforce a kind of purity that is unattainable, uh, I mean, this is very literally a, a holier-than-thou logic within the organization uh, that, that allows the organization to remain um, uh, coherent in a way in the, in the eyes of its followers. But at what point does that holier-than-thou attitude sort of propagate to an extent that uh, the organization itself cannot hold together any longer because the internal um, differences of interpretation among various elites um, make it so that uh, they, they, they wind up essentially at each other's, at each other's throats? Uh, 
so far the 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 squabbles over the holier than thou attitude uh, don't seem to have have by and large risen to the level of 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 uh, public awareness. Um, I don't I don't see some burbling uh, unrest on that on that topic uh, within the Islamic State. But then again. They're very good about controlling their message. So if, if it's there, it, it, it might just be invisible to, to me and to most others. We'll go to Tony for, I think, a two-fingered interjection here and then to Ali Sada. I think that first, it is very important to keep reminding ourselves of the importance of strategic communications. It's equally important to remember who the hell we are, which is a bunch of secular Americans who are not Islamic and not part of this. I think that we need to be very careful about what we can and cannot do. We could help, I think, countries in the region if they were better prepared to be proactive, less reliant on traditional lines of authority, more willing to react and investigate and involve themselves in a much wider use of media, reaching out to targeted groups and so on which I think are serious weaknesses as I watch what governments are doing, although they're trying to get better. But quite frankly, and I would defer to Graham on this, having watched us over 10 years try to message in a different context, I'm not sure we've done much to demonstrate we have great capability to really reach out to the cadres we need to reach out. I would say that in contrast, what has weakened movements like this in the past? Well, it isn't that they have power struggles. Every single revolution I can think of had a bloody cycle of internal violence and killing of rival cadres. The question is, does somebody win and preserve some degree of unity? When they break up, that's been a key issue. But if they are simply fighting for who is in charge, that doesn't seem to have the impact historically it might. I think that losing does matter. You say there's no military solution, and ultimately there isn't. But losing the fight really does matter to movements historically. Breaks them up, splinters them, they lose legitimacy. Economic and social factors can have an impact over time but here, one thing that you have to remember is when you're fighting in the context of a civil war, everybody has serious economic and social problems. And so you don't get the immediacy that people sometimes expect. Uh, it doesn't have quite the same faction. What cost them the last time, as I think many of you know, because this is really the successor to Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia, was they became so extreme they alienated their own internal cadres. And I didn't see any evidence from ground what you found that they had reached that yet. And that was in part, I think, because they're focusing on people who are seen as legitimate opposition, but that doesn't mean that they will continue that way. The other thing that might have a major impact, and this has been a key factor in counterinsurgencies we tend to forget, if the insurgency meets a government that becomes progressively more legitimate, that does have a major factor in, in breaking up and undermining the insurgency's ideology. It's kind of strategic communication which really reaches. But let me just say, Syria is going to become more legitimate. Iraq, uh, maybe. But we haven't seen that so far. And remember that last year's diagnostics, without a lot of progress, were in a country which had approximately 40% more oil revenues. And I think one thing we do have to remember here when we talk about what's going to happen over the course of the next year is Iraq in per capita income is next to Yemen in terms of having actual economic strains. It's basically at about a quarter 
of Iran's per capita income, which is the next lowest in the region, and that was before the oil revenues were cut. So the question of legitimacy here is going to be a fascinating one because we may find our partner is going to be in at least as much trouble as the Islamic State. I guess I would ask you, uh, any of you, for all of the talk about al-Hura and creating this centralized message in the United States to counter Islamic extremism, has anybody seen any really positive results? Thanks, Tony. We have time for one more question. Ali, if you can ask a brief question, and then I want to wrap it up. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be late. I misunderstood the, the time. Um, just one question. By, by saying Islamic in the state, aren't, aren't we falling into uh, Daesh's propaganda? Aren't we saying exactly what they want us to say? No, I, th I think they, what they would like us to say uh, is, is that uh, they're not interested in, in the, the description of them as Islamic the way that, w that I, for example, have, have described them as being Islamic. Um, the, the question that they want us to, to weigh in on is whether they're, they're the right kind of Islamic. You disagree? I'm sorry. We are giving them the banner. In the 1950s, 60s, 70s, the banner was communism, socialism. Now we are giving them the banner of Islamic. Just the impact of the world is very important for them. That's my point. Um, so it, it may be the case that, that accurately describing them is something that they, that they would like. And uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I would certainly agree that, that you know, the, the truth has its own uses for, for many different sides. I could, as a journalist, not describe them as having religious convictions at all. And that would be, I, I think, something that they would immediately be able to, to counter by pointing out exactly the ways in which they do care about these things. Uh, if the reality is that they have, as you know, councils of scholars, these are fringe elements, and uh, that to understand the way that they think of themselves does require describing them in these terms that, that they, I, I think, believe dignify them. But it's also, I think, in the long term, you do want to have a clear-eyed view of who they are and how they conceive of themselves to understand what their messages are, what's important to them, and what's important to their potential recruits. So, you know, if, if we call them Islamic and accurately say that they care about, about uh, scripture, religion, then um, they, they have even said directly to me, uh, supporters have said to me, we like that you have described us this way. You have, you have accurately, or you've represented us in a way that we recognize. And that, that is exactly what I was trying to do. And they, this certainly does have its uses, but they've also said, by doing this, you've also given a, a pretty good blueprint on how to counteract our messages. And they say, it's ironic. We even find it ironic ourselves that uh, an article that, that we find an accurate depiction of us and that we in, endorse in a way and would send out to other people who are curious about us also contains instructions on how to defeat us. So in a, in a way, it, it, you are an enemy and in a way, you are a friend in writing this piece. And um, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's something I'll, 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 uh, I'll admit to if, 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 they, if they want. Well, yes, and, and I, I understand that there are limits to political rhetoric, so I, I acknowledge that. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Graham. This was a, a great event, a spectacular piece you wrote. Uh, thank you so much for coming down from Yale to uh, discuss this with us. Thank you, Dr. Cordesman, as well, for your superb commentary. Thanks to everyone for coming. We have some great upcoming events. We will have a similar discussion on Libya, which may involve Hunter Keith, which would be great. And we will also have the counter ISIS uh, point person at the White House National Security Council come over as well. So look out for those uh, events coming up. And thanks again, and uh, have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>